KC Laboratory. Sponsored by Emprise Bank. It's the KC Laboratory presented by Emprise Bank. Find a bank that delivers real solutions to help you reach your goals. It's like two, three jet chip wasp. It's championship game type thinking. Emprise Bank is your partner in possible. Emprise Bank member FDIC, big supporters here at KC Sports Network. So appreciative of them and what they've done to make uh, this sports network what it is uh, in such a short amount of time. Really grateful for them. And uh, we've got a lot to talk about today because, boys, there is a preseason game we get to preview. Maddie Lane, I am so excited about this. Can't, you cannot bury the lead. We are all back together. The parental chaperone is back <laughs> with us. The big institution is here to keep us in line, to keep us in check. Craig, how have you been, buddy? I know you're excited to talk football, but it's just been a while since you've been here to keep Kent and I under control. Okay, parental chaperone actually broke me there. That, that, was, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. I, I I will accept that one. That, that one was good enough for me to accept. No, it's great. Uh, football is here. Football is in the air. We are going to talk about this upcoming game, but make sure you stay locked in to KCSN. Subscribe to this YouTube page. Subscribe to the Substack. Get the film reviews. Stay in tune with what we're doing. We're going to be talking about this team a lot. We are in the season now, so we are ramping up. We are hitting everything as hard as we can, including a pregame show happening on Saturday. It will be live before the game. We are going to be recording from our good pals at Emprise, doing a quick little pregame show to get you ready. So stay tuned to the YouTube channel. You can Tune in with that. Have us be a part of your little pregame experience. And then, you know, stay tuned for the rest of the stuff that we got after that. Yeah, I may or may not be in the presence of a Craig Stout this weekend, and I am irrationally mm. excited for that. Mm. And Maddie, be jealous. I, You know what? <laughs> I'm just going to rub it in your face. It's okay. You wonder how come you don't get compliments. when it's <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we've got a lot to talk about today. This is the first chance for us to kind of preview a – Lie, or a real game, real-ish mm-hmm. game with, you know, two opposing teams playing in a stadium with different jerseys. I mean, you know, like, you know, you know we're going to get a small glimpse at, you know, at the, at the first team, it sounds like, per Andy Reid. And I think we've got to start off the jump with this. It's the offensive line. I think that's the big question here. This is a new offensive line uh, left to right uh, that you're going to probably see uh, you know, in the first preseason game, Lucas Neing, I would anticipate, is probably going to be in there with the first team. Mike Remmers is kind of gingerly getting back into the mix here a little bit, but I feel like there's a pretty short turnaround for him to be back. So left to right, you're going to see an entirely new five than what you saw the last time the Kansas City Chiefs wore their game jerseys, Maddie. Yeah, absolutely. And the first thing I want to say is do not overreact to anything that happens in the first preseason game. If guys look rusty, if guys don't communicate well, if this group of entirely new players for the Kansas City Chiefs, all new starters, three of whom are essentially rookies, do not look like they're on the same page every single play, it is okay. This is what the preseason is for. That being said, you should be, as a Chiefs fan, excited to see what these guys can do. There's been a lot of talk during training camp about how Orlando Brown maybe hasn't looked as good as what was anticipated, how the Ravens have fleeced the Chiefs in a trade via trade value charts or via just how he's performed in one-on-ones. But here's my challenge to you is go watch him in team periods. See how well he's played. See if the the preseason games look like he has in team periods where he's been excellent. Look how this new unit plays together. What's it look like when they're going up against another team? This is just our first glimpse of that. It's not about any specific player. You just want to see these guys playing with each other, understanding how to operate as a unit, work with Patrick Mahomes within the offense. This is where my eyes are going to be glued for much of the first team reps. And I think that's where everybody else should be focused on as well. Yes, absolutely. You want these guys to build to that cohesion. It's obviously not just something that you can flip a switch and have everybody be on the same page and know exactly the way that everybody's going to play. A bunch of guys that have played football at a very high level, though, and a bunch of very highly intelligent guys that have 
very, very good football character. Andy Reid, Andy Heck talk about that a lot. And that's what these guys have. So I do think that we are going to see a much more improved offensive line quickly. But yes, like Maddie said, there will be some miscommunications. There will be some blitzes, some stunts, some games that aren't picked up. But let's hope that the 49ers aren't really flexing their, you know, the the stunt work up front there. This is a preseason game after all. So we'll, we'll see what all gets thrown at the Chiefs. But I am really excited to see this specific group of guys work together and maybe some of the concepts that come out of it. Again, not trying to read too much into it, but if we start seeing a lot more gap concepts, if we start seeing a little bit more of that. I think that that is a good positive indicator that Andy Reid is putting a lot of this on wax because he wants you know defenses to have to prepare for it. He wants it to be known we're doing this now, and you've got to be able to take account of the fact that we're going to line up and run some power in this upcoming season. What a big thing, I think you kind of alluded to it. I don't want to see the 49ers come out with a bunch of stunts and games and blitzes, but I do want to see them turn Eric Armstead, Javon Kinlaw, Nick Bosa loose. I want to see those guys try to get their best reps. I mean, two of those guys and Kinlaw and Nick Bosa are essentially going to be second year of play with Bosa coming off of an injury. I want to see those guys go 110% because I want to see how this offensive line handles a relatively talented San Francisco 49ers defensive line. I want to see how well, you know, how dominant is this revamped offensive line in the blocking game and the run game? Can they come off the ball and move these bodies, get to that second level, get to those linebackers, unlike they were able to do last year? When they're making a pocket, is there going to be a clean pocket or is Javon Kinlaw going to continue to crush it like defensive tackles did routinely last season? What does it look like versus a talented defensive lineup the Chiefs are looking to be facing on Saturday? It's so interesting, this offensive line group, because I think from a high-level perspective, you're fascinated by how this group's going to gel, the chemistry, if they're able to develop it, how quickly they're able to develop it, how well do they work together. But I think at an individual level, Across the board, there's interesting storylines, too. And that's what makes this group such a focal point for us and a lot of people covering the Chiefs this entire preseason. It's, you know, this is such a, I mean, such a well-established team and a lot of newness at this position, but also a lot of intrigue from rookies to high, you know, uh, high contract signings to big draft pick acquisition or big draft capital acquisition, which turned into a even more convoluted mathematic question this weekend or this week you know like there's just so many little mini miniature storylines within a bigger storyline up front um and i'm super fascinated by that i think this might be a good chance to maybe just talk about some players that we're all looking forward to watching too let's just cut into that a little bit here craig give me a player you're looking forward to watching i am looking forward to watching chris jones play defensive end. I think that they that the Chiefs are going to give him the opportunity to play defensive end and to get a lot of run in. I know we've talked about him moving around a lot, but he needs these live reps at defensive end. Now is the time. And I think that he's going up against some good tackles on the outside against the 49ers. So I want to see how he looks against NFL level guys when the pads come on and the bolts are flying 110% just like I look forward to going to our good pals at Macadoodles every single time I get to go into Macadoodles. I get irrationally excited. The customer service, the selection, everything that they bring to the table is phenomenal. And so when I get to be in the vicinity of a Macadoodles, I get excited and I have great anticipation for it. We need one of these in Kansas City because I want to have that same anticipation. I want to go up to a Chiefs game before I head out to Arrowhead to tailgate. I want to stop by a McAdoodles, pick up all my alcohol, get the same customer service that I would expect at any McAdoodles location and be able to have myself a good time. Get a hold of Roger at info at McAdoodles.com if you're a franchisee to bring them up here. But yeah, I'm really amped to watch Chris Jones out there. I think I think he's got the potential for a, a defensive player of the year season here. So I, this might be the first domino to fall on that one. 
And I really am excited to see his matchup against Mike McGlinchey. I'm presuming that's where he's going to play most of the time. If the Chiefs want to throw him on Trent Williams too, hey, have at it. I'd love to see the matchup. But I think McGlinchey presents a really good kind of opening test for Chris Jones at defensive end because he's good, but not great. It's going to challenge Chris Jones as a run defender, but give him a very winnable matchup as a pass as a pass rusher. So I like that matchup there. I think that's a good there's bar to look at and gauge how well Chris Jones is going to be. A guy I'm excited to watch, Devin Keat, safety, probably going to play mostly with the second team, but that should pit him up against the 49ers when they trot out Trey Lance. And I think Kyle Shanahan's going to be really letting Lance just let loose. I think they're going to want to put Lance out there to show off a little bit. I think they're going to let Lance go out there and try to, you know, just throw the ball a little bit more than maybe Jimmy Garoppolo does. And that's going to give uh, Devin Key a lot of opportunities to make plays, to showcase what he can do in coverage, show his tracking ability, maybe have to corral Lance in open field areas. So like, I just like this matchup to see a second string defensive back like Devin Key, who's building up a lot of hype, go out there and hopefully keep building on a strong training camp. I'm looking forward to seeing Noah Gray. I think that's one guy I'm very excited to you know, get my eyes on. And I'm not sure how much Travis Kelsey is going to play. I could see a situation where Travis Kelsey doesn't get as much run as maybe uh, the entirety of that group. I think, weirdly, I think the you know Patrick Mahomes, the offensive line, getting some that full fir- first quarter probably makes a lot of sense. But I think it actually could be more beneficial to throw Noah Gray there in the Travis Kelsey role a little bit and let him you know kind of move all over the field a little bit if they're going to do that let Travis Kelsey, you know, get a little, a little rest. You know, he's had, you know, some nicks here and, and, and missed a little bit of time during training camp already. I think it makes sense for him and Tyreek Hill to exit early. Um, especially considering, I think there's a lot of question marks around some of these secondary pass catchers, you know, outside of the Tyreek Hill, outside of Travis Kelsey. I think there's a lot of guys that maybe haven't established themselves to the same level. And I think that's something that is worth paying t- attention to at a high level guys is, you know, all these, you know, these weapons competing for potential targets, the trust of Patrick Mahomes, Byron Pringle, McCall Harvin, Noah Gray, Demarcus Robinson, all these guys. I think this is one of the more fascinating storylines here, Craig. Yeah, definitely. And I think you can see a lot more instances where Andy Reid might try stuff, try and get singular matchups for Clyde edwards helaire for McCole Hardman, for Demarcus Robinson, for these tight ends. You're going to see situations where it might be specifically dialed up for those guys just to see the way that they're running that specific route, how they react to the, you know, the real time instances of all of that stuff. So that's the kind of stuff that you're going to be able to take away from some of these matchups, some of these secondary pass catchers, like can't call them there. It's the ability to have stuff dialed up for them and perform at a high level, be able to adapt, be able to execute. Even if you're not the guy that is dialed up for, how do you work? How do you create for everybody else? Sammy Watkins talked about it, how he's, you know, had to be the setup guy for some of these things. And, that's important in an Andy Reid offense. Everybody has to be tailored and executed at a high level. So you are going to see concepts. You are going to see specific things that may not look pretty because the defense sniffs it out and there wasn't really another option for that ball to go anywhere else. But it might be one where it works out to where Andy Reid gets to get a look at some of these secondary pass catchers. It, it, how do you feel about that, Matty? Am I, am I kind of hitting that on the head there or am I way off? <laughs> No, I I think that's a good way to go about kind of approaching a preseason game. Something I kind of like in the same mold to pay attention to as the preseason games get going is you know you're going to get a lot of basic coverages. You know you're going to get a lot of basic offensive concepts. So everything that you can see is relatively predictable, but you want to see guys look comfortable in that. You want to see these receivers understand where holes and basic zone coverages that you can probably predict what they're going to be based on down at distance if you've prepared for the team at all, you can kind of get ready for these kind of things. You want to see a McCole Hardman come out and show an understanding of what spacing is going to be. You want to see Demarcus Robinson come out and know the timing or the spacing on his comeback routes, on his dig routes, stuff like that. Things that haven't been consistent in the past. You want to see them getting better at those things as it goes along. And on that same notion, like I think there's a good chance for someone like Noah Gray to really come out and just show his growth Mm -hmm. as an NFL player throughout training camp. Does he look like he belongs against these basic defenses? If he does, that's a good sign that he might start picking up more and more snaps once you get into the actual season. Craig, 
I want you to go ahead and give me a kind of a high level thing that you're kind of watching in this first preseason game. What's what's a narrative? What's a storyline? What's something kind of at a high level you're looking at? I want to see how the corner rotation looks. Mm-hmm. I want to see it, it, more specifically how the secondary rotation looks. I, I want to see where the safeties end up lining up. If we end up with some of those three safety looks in the nickel, or if we are going to a true nickel where it's going to be Tyra Matthew and a either Dan Sorensen or Juan Thornhill, and then three corners on the field. I want to see who those guys are. I think we know that Legereus Need is kicking into the slot, and so we expect to see that a lot out of him. But the next guys after that, who is it on the outside playing with those guys? And then the guys behind him, where are those guys competing? Do we see Mike Hughes run with the first team on the outside, and then maybe with the second team, he's kicking into the inside, and they're actually getting a look at both positions. I'm very, very curious to see where some of those guys end up looking. I hope we get to see some dime looks as well, although the 49ers traditionally run a little bit heavier, so we may not, but I was hoping, hope to see a little more dime so that we can see what some of that safety rotation looks in the box as well. I'm just really excited to see with all these new pieces, with all these young pieces that have varying ways that they can be cost controlled going forward. I want to know the ones that are actually getting run and the ones that look good against NFL competition. And you think this is a pretty good matchup to kind of see what you have with the cornerback room, especially the 49ers aren't going to spread it out. They're not going to play a ton of 11 personnel and let the Chiefs really show off some of their coverage packages, whether you're talking regular season or preseason. Yeah. Even once you get past Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk, you aren't dealing with the most talented wide receiver core. So you would really hope guys like DeAndre Baker and Mike Hughes, if they get in there with the second team or the first team or whenever, that they look pretty good. Like This is a matchup that they should look relatively good in based on the competition they're going up against, how that offense works. So I I don't know how telling this particular game will be for either one of those guys, but I think it will be interested to see who gets that first crack. Is it Baker? Is it Hughes? Where's Rashad Fenton playing? Is it this in the slot with the first team? Like there's a lot of rotation questions that can be answered. I just don't know about the actual performance on the field, if it'll lead to a lot. And can't and is there a position battle that you think you can get some information from based on this first preseason game matchup? Or do you kind of think everything's going to be settled later on? I mean, I don't want to get too, you know, like there's still a lot of time here. And so I don't want to just completely, you know, say that we're going to get a ton of information from this first go around necessarily from a rotation perspective, from a depth chart perspective. But I do also think it's not, it, it's not, it's not a non point either. And I, I think specifically at the cornerback position, you look at it and you know, we, we kind of talked about this a little early in the week, Maddie. I think, you know, the DeAndre Baker, Mike Hughes situation here, this is a very big off preseason for them for a lot of different reasons. It's not just, you know, playing well, it's staying healthy. It's, you know, Deontay Deontay Baker just needs these reps. Like it's such a, sometimes in some of these situations with this roster, there are guys that just need preseason games. I mean, we talked about the offense, Lucas Niang, I did the math. He hasn't played a football game in like 600 days. I, you know, it's, it's over 600 days that he's played an actual football game. And Deandre Baker, he played week 17 and broke his leg, and now this guy's getting thrown into the fire. Mike Hughes has only played half the games in his NFL career. Like, there's so many storylines here when it just comes from the, how valuable these reps are. You know, so there's, like, I think there's a balance here of, you know, collecting information throughout this process, but also giving some grace to some guys as they're transitioning back into football shape, back into actually being in a game setting. It's such a, it's such a weird balance to navigate, but I think that's why – you know, maybe more than ever, it's going to be hard to parse some of this information, especially what I find so interesting. I know I'm rambling now. What I find so interesting is the Chiefs are relying on, like on paper, the Chiefs have some interesting guys at the cornerback spot. Like with Mike Hughes, it's interesting. DeAndre Baker, interesting. But they're unknowns in a lot of different ways. So they're, but the Chiefs are, it, they are relying on these guys that they that they have limited information on right now. I think that's one of the most interesting things about this, you know, this offseason, specifically at the cornerback position. Maddie, is there a storyline, a high-level storyline you're looking at? 
Well, I, mine's similar to what I asked you. I think the linebacker, kind of your linebacker two position battle that you, they kind of have going on between a Nick Bolton, the Willie Gay, Ben Neiman. I actually think that this game could lead you in the right direction to solving that for the simple fact that like we talked about, the 49ers aren't going to come out with a lot of spread off and stuff. They're going to pack it in. You're going to have a lot of two tight ends, a lot of two running backs, sometimes two tight ends, two running back sets. And going back to the fact that it's going to be basic looks because it's the NFL preseason, your linebackers should have really good reads in this game. Your linebackers should play mentally fast in the preseason because everything is pretty straightforward. Yes, there's still play action. Yes, they're still going to be pulling offensive linemen, but it's not disguised like it is in the regular season. You want to see the linebackers see the game very clearly in the preseason because that means they have a chance to see it clearly in the regular season. Not that they will, but that there's a chance. If you get out there and you have these young linebackers who can't get to the right hole that are two steps behind the blockers or the running back getting to where they need to be, that's not a good sign because it's only going to get more complicated from here. So I'm interested to see how Nick Bolton's reading the field. How's Willie Gay reading the field? I really think the Chiefs need Willie Gay to step up and start figuring out if he comes out and plays mentally and physically fast in this game, like that hype train is taking off to the highest Mm -hmm. heights. Like, it well, won't stop until he plays poorly. Oh, go on, Kent. We may not see Willie Gay on, on Saturday. Um, and actually, we'll just... Oh, the concussion, yeah. We're going we're gonna to shout out Eddie High here, uh, who is <laughs> he's been cutting clips up of practice like every day uh, at Eddie High on Twitter. Willie Gay in pads today said he's going to be a full go on Monday, which if there by the, that timeline would indicate that we may not mm. get to see Willie Gay. But I think the point still stands in a lot of different ways. Now Nick Bolton probably gets thrust in a position where we get to see more of him. Gives him a chance to, you know, maybe get to do a little bit more too, frankly, Maddie. Yeah, and this if Willie Gay's unable to go, you're going to see a lot more Nick Bolton and you need him to get reps. We talked about it with the other young guys. He hasn't played a snap in the NFL. You need him to get out there. You need him to get live reps. So if he can go out there, same thing as I was saying about Willie Gay, if he can go out there and play mentally fast and allow him to maximize on his athletic potential, that's a good sign going forward. I do think that Willie Gay is going to be a little bit more important to the Chiefs' success going forward than Nick Bolton is, but that doesn't mean that in this first game of the preseason, he can't come out and give you a reason to be super hopeful and to really like his you know prospect as an impact linebacker going forward. This is just the first step for these young linebackers to show that they understand the pro game. And I just think preseason is a good place to do it because of how simplistic the reads are. I'm just going back to the fact that, that Maddie thinks that this is going to be basic. This is still Kyle Shanahan. Let's not, (laughs) (laughs) let's not, let's not pretend. I'll tell you what, if I'm up with a baby at like three 30 in the morning, this morning, I I might, I might turn on some old Kyle Shanahan preseason games to see how versatile it is on game pass. On well, <laughs> on something, I'll find them somewhere. <laughs> All right, I got another question for you guys. Um, it's late in the third quarter on Saturday night, and we're deep into the deep into the depth chart of the Kansas City Chiefs. Who are you excited to watch in that second half of that game, late third quarter, that kind of window? Who is the guy that you're most looking forward to watching in that window? And it can't be the end of side of your eyelids, boys. <laughs> I'm going with Tim Ward. Um, I, I, Tim Ward, I think, flashed a little bit when he got to play in week 17 of last year. I wrote about that on the KCSN Substacks. So scroll back and you can see how he played on all that. I want to see how he's developed. I want to see this full year because – The very first year that he was here with the Chiefs, he was on the pup list, and he was basically redshirted that year. And then he had the COVID offseason last year where he didn't get to work out, be in the building as much as I think he probably would have liked. So he gets a full offseason this year. I haven't heard a ton about Tim Ward coming out of camp, and I've realized that that's, that's an easy thing to do with a guy like that. There's a lot of hype from a lot of other guys, but putting on the pads, going up against those types of guys, If he can come out and show really well, he can make this defensive end rotation a little bit spicy and make Brett Veach have to make some decisions there that maybe he doesn't want to do right now. I'm going to stick at the same position and go with Joshua Kane, though, because Mm. I think there's a much higher ceiling. I think he has the highest ceiling out of any defensive end not named Chris Jones on this roster right now. 
I think in the preseason, defensive linemen, linebackers have a relatively easy job compared to the regular season, especially if the Chiefs are up at this point in time and he's getting to pin his ears back and just attempt to showcase what he can do as a pass rusher. I think that's just exciting football. At this point of the game, it's not going to be the prettiest football. It's not going to be the most technically sound football. You got to find little things that you want to see. I want to see Kendo come out with a rush plan. I want to see him utilize his athleticism, his speed, his bend better than he did at Florida State. These are things that I can directly relate to because I just spent a lot of time watching him for the KC draft guide after the Chiefs drafted him. So there's a lot of, you know, recency bias there. But that's one thing that I'm really looking forward to seeing as we get deep into the game. Speaking of the KC draft guide, a guy that we were really high on in 2020 was Prince Tigo Winogo. And honestly, the movement skills, the talent was obvious when we were out there in St. Joseph last week. He moves better than Lucas Niang does right now. It's not even close. And he looks a little bit more, honestly, he probably looks a little bit more ready than Lucas Niang does right now. Um, it's such a fascinating case because the talent is undeniable with Prince Tiga Winogo. It's just, there's, you know, there's just a lot of medical concerns with him. And so I'm just fascinated to see how that talent has translated because this is really our first chance to get eyes on him in a game setting too. I don't know what the outlook for him long-term is going to be, but I know I am, he's one of the more intriguing bottom of the roster guys here because I could see them, you know, holding on to him on the practice squad, continuing to work through Mm -hmm. maybe some of the medical issues that he's had that's hampered his draft stock coming out of the draft. That's hampered his, you know, opportunity with the Philadelphia Eagles and ultimately landed up here. I mean, the chiefs, have held on to him for nearly a calendar year now because the talent is undeniable. It's never been an issue there in that perspective. It's all about the medicals. It's all about that and trying to navigate and manage that. I think it's going to be fun to watch him because I thought he actually looked decent uh, when we were out there in St. Joseph. So I'm pretty excited about watching him. Another late second half guy I'm keeping my eye on, Darius Shepard. I think there's an outside chance he makes the roster specifically for his return ability, but just what does he show on the offensive side of the ball? I don't expect him to get a lot of run there, even if he does make the team. But if there's an injury to Tyree Kill or McCole Hartman, can his speed, you know, potentially step up and play some form of role on the offensive side? Or is he just purely a return man 24 7? It's just an interesting guy to keep an eye on, I think, late in the game, especially when you're looking at him as a receiver. You guys aren't aren't amped for the Austin Watkins versus Marlon character you know, breakdown that's going to happen in the third quarter there. Let's go. <laughs> Come Maybe on. DiCaprio bootleg. I was, surprised, I was surprised Craig didn't go with DiCaprio bootle. If I'm being honest, like I was kind of anticipating that was going to be my man's boot. running with the twos. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, Hey, he was shadowing, you know, he was shadowing the ones a little bit and sitting in the back there with Steve we'll Spagnuolo we'll getting see. mental reps. Austin and, Watkins might not be in the game at that point either. So. I mean, yeah, no, this that's is true. also the first look we're going to get at potentially one of just the scariest interior defensive lines in football with Jerron mm-hmm. Reed and Derek Nottie playing next to each other. That's that's a lot of power in a lot of man sitting in the middle of a defensive line unit, especially you slap Chris Jones on the outside of those guys. That's a that's a lot of weight sitting on a defensive line, right? There's just going to be fun to watch. All right. I uh, this this means absolutely nothing. Everything. <laughs> but I want us all to do a score prediction. Maddie, start us off. Um, 24 to 16. Kent, you go next. I, you, are you sure you want me to go next? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. The Chiefs are going to be down 20 to 10 in the fourth quarter. And Shane Bouchelle is going to run Wasp. To Darius Shepard to spark a comeback, and the Kansas City Chiefs are going to beat the San Francisco 49ers 31 to 20. Was that where you were going? Is it going to who who who's running in the who's running in the touchdown? Who's running in the touchdown? Is it Elijah Darwin? McGuire. Dar- it's Derek McKinnon. Elijah McGuire. No, it's Jerry, well, we 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 comped we comped uh, Jerick McKinnon to to Damian Williams. Well, there you go. It's He's Jerick just not McKinnon. playing. At the end of the fourth quarter of a preseason <laughs> football game. No, my my score prediction is I will have several beers and just enjoy. <laughs> that that's going to be my score. I'm not keeping track. 
Hey, you, I don't know if you're going to find Craig on the KC Laboratory postgame show, <laughs> but we'll find out. That's going to do it for the game preview. Thank you so much for listening, watching, and thank you so much to Emprise Bank for all they've done to make this possible. Uh, we'll be at an Emprise Bank on Saturday doing a pregame show. Make sure you check out everything going on on the KCSN YouTube channel. We'll catch you later.